you take your Bibles. Turn me up, turn me up. There you go. Sit down, sit down. Have a seat, have a seat. All right, have a seat if you don't mind, have a seat. Sit down, sit down. Boy, I... I'm excited about being here. Of course, I'm excited. I, I was supposed to be excited about being here Wednesday. I wasn't supposed to be here today. In fact, I took a selfie of me in the choir and sent it to Tony Hudson and say, why'd you quit on anchor, Tony? Why'd you quit on anchor? And uh, so I sent him a text. And so I turned my phone off because I didn't want the response I thought I was going to get. But I'm, I'm glad you're Now, he said whatever I asked you to do. Did you hear that? Good. Uh, we're going to dismiss for 30 minutes. If you'll be back here, Starbucks is just around the road. Anchor is buying in honor of their 25th anniversary. And if you'll make sure you come back. But uh, I am glad to be here. Uh, Anchor holds a very, very special place in my life. Uh, many times I, I came, I uh, have come here to preach and only to find myself being blessed. And uh, the music has just been incredible. And every time I get to hear the choir and the singer sing, and uh, it's just something incredible. But I'm going to jump right into it because I'm not even supposed to be here. Uh, so I'm in the invisible man tonight. So I'm not supposed to be here. Nehemiah chapter 13. And uh, congratulations to Ma and Paul Bell on 25 years. And, uh, you know, are you sure you know when your anniversary is? Okay. All right. All right. Just. Just want to make sure you know, because you chose April, then you said June and July and August. And when's your anniversary? Oh, did he get it right? What year? <laughs> 41 years ago on July 14th. And uh, I was preaching in the state of Utah. And uh, you know how on the back of cars, Brother Jenkins, they have the... Uh, you know, the, the husband, the wife, and all the children. And the state of Utah just had a husband and then a wife and children, wife and children, wife and children, wife and children. And uh, so uh, we're in the state of Utah, amen. And uh, hope that didn't offend anybody. I don't care, but I just hope it didn't. So we're glad you're here. What a pulpit. I mean, what? I don't, I don't think anybody is moving that pulpit tonight. And I don't think anybody's going to, ah, not that pulpit. That's a man's pulpit right there. Good night. I bet that puppy's heavy right there. So forgive us preachers. We admire buildings, and, right? And we love pulpit. In fact, I really, really want to rub my cheek against this cherry wood right here. And okay, I got my fix. Now I can go back to preaching. And honestly, I've been looking at it. I think I can stick my feet in there. I can stick my hands. I want to preach like this. That's just preachers right there. Look at this, man. All right, Nehemiah chapter 13, verse number 1. And uh, let's all stand, if you don't mind, Nehemiah chapter 13 and verse number 1. And I really do mean this. I'm going to get right into the sermon, and I'm going to get done and get out of the way uh, so that Brother Jenkins can come. And I have my popcorn and my water, so I am set. And, uh, and I love you, but don't touch my popcorn. And uh, so Nehemiah chapter 13, verse number 1. On that day, they read in the book of Moses in the audience of the people, and therein was found written that the Ammonite and the Moabite should not come into the congregation of God forever, because they met not the children of Israel with bread and with water, but hired Balaam against them that he should curse them, howbeit our God turned the curse into a blessing. That's going to be our starting point there in the Nehemiah chapter 13, and this is a very, very interesting chapter. And I'm going to preach on this subject, abuse at the house of God. Now, I'm not going to tell you how to abuse people at the house of God. My mama could abuse her children at the house of God, and nobody ever know we were being abused. When you'd mess up in church, you know that fat, hangy down part on the back of your arm? Ma okay, no. Okay. Mama, when you'd mess up, she'd be looking at dad and she would just be smiling as big as she could and she'd slide her hand up there, grab that part of fat and twist that thing. And then when you would start crying, she would always say, stop that crying. And I was like, how can I stop it? You're twisting my arm. And my mother knew how to get her point across in church. In fact, while she was sitting in the choir, uh, she had three stages before she came and got you. Uh, the first stage was she just looked at you. 
I mean, it, didn't, it didn't matter. If she was singing in the choir and they're supposed to be looking at the choir director and you were acting up, she would just stare right at you and she would just continue to sing. And you knew mama's looking at me. Mama's going to come get me. Second one is she would drop that head and look through them eyebrows at you. Third one is she would drop that head, look at her eyebrows and do that. And then you were done. Didn't matter where you were at, where dad was at in the service. She would get up out of the choir, come down, get you, walk you out, whoop the snot out of you, bring you back in, set you down, come back up to the choir. You say, how do you know that? Because I experienced it that firsthand at 15 years of age. I was on the third row goofing off, and she gave me the first sign from third base. Second sign from third base. Third sign, she had enough. She had this philosophy, you're going to embarrass me publicly. I will embarrass you publicly, and you won't like that at all. I mean, she's nuts. That's what she is. In fact, never mind. I better stop. She may be listening. So... Let's talk about abuse at the house of God. Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask you tonight to help me. I do not ask for your help because of me. I ask for your help because of the truth of your word. And Lord, so many times our expectations of what will happen in a service must be yielded to what you want to happen in a service. And Lord, help us all with open hearts tonight. Just sit here and, and, and relish in the fact that we are with believers and Lord, that we're blood washed and blood bought and Lord, we're saved. Lord, none of us here would mind if that trumpet would sound right now, and we're just out of here. God, I ask you to please fill our hearts, motivate us, inspire us tonight to love you more and to be more committed to the things of God. Thank you that we are here at this time in this place with these people. Speak to us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May be seated. The book of Nehemiah is characterized by the desolation of the wall of Jerusalem and Nehemiah's quest to rebuild the wall and the city. However, when you come to the end of the book in chapter 13, you find that Nehemiah is taking on the influences that had truly brought about abuse of the Sabbath day and the disdain for the laws and ways of God. I think one word, if you'll look in verse number 18, one word that would sum up the entire problem and is found right there. If you'll underline it, it's found right here. Are you ready? Look at verse number 18. Did not your fathers thus and did not our God bring all this evil upon us and upon this city, yet ye bring more wrath upon Israel by, what's the next word? Profaning. You know what Nehemiah was saying here? The one problem with your attitude is, is that you're profaning it. In other words, they were taking what was supposed to be a sacred day, the Sabbath, and they were making it an ordinary secular day. They were taking something that the activity on the Sabbath was not to reflect the culture, but it was to reflect God. And they started to take the Sabbath. They listen, if you read through here, which we're going to do, but you'll find out on the, on the Sabbath, they listen to what they were doing. A day that belonged to the Lord, they were treading wine on the Sabbath day. They were bringing in the sheaves on the Sabbath day. They were laying down the donkeys to work on the Sabbath, on the Sabbath day. They were selling vittles on the Sabbath day. The men of Tyre were allowed inside the city to sell fish and all manner of wares. Instead of the Sabbath, and please get this, instead of the Sabbath influencing the rest of the six days, guess what started happening? The six days started influencing and infiltrating the Sabbath day. Did you hear that? Instead of Sunday, in Sabbath, Sabbath day influencing the other six days. The other six days were starting to influence the Sabbath day. By the way, we have the same problem here in the United States of America in 2014 in this culture in Christianity. Instead of Sunday being a big influence on Monday, Monday influences Sunday. Instead of Sunday influencing Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday, uh uh, the church doors are open up to where what is going on during the week has become a bigger deal in the lives of people than what goes on on Sunday. So Nehemiah saw the abuses of the Sabbath in the house of God and he did several things. Now I'm going to tell you right now, you better thank God Nehemiah is not your pastor. We who think we're tough look like kindergartners compared to Nehemiah. I want you to look at verse number seven. Look at verse number seven. There was no tender loving care by Nehemiah here. He done had enough. Look at Nehemiah 13 verse seven. And I came to Jerusalem and understood of the evil that Eliashib did for Tobiah in preparing him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. They built a prophet's chamber for a heathen. 
They, they built a little studio apartment for an Ammonite. And look what Nehemiah did. He said, when I saw it, look at verse number eight, and it grieved me sore. By the way, I apologize for making you use your Bible. I know usually it's just a closed book on your lap, but we're going to keep it open tonight. Look at verse eight. And it grieved me sore, therefore, look at it, I cast forth all the household stuff of Tobiah out of the chamber. When the man of God showed up, he said, who lives in this prophet's chamber? And they said, well, an Ammonite does. He said, what in the world, what in the world is a cabinet member of Obama doing living next to the house of God? I'm looking for the non-smiler so I can say it again. It looks like everybody's smiling, so I got to move on. Oh, good night. What in the world is this heathen doing? So guess what? He never asked to buy a permission. He never got a signed release form. He just went in and said, hey, get this stuff out of the house of God. He didn't care how he threw it out. He didn't wrap it up. He didn't bubble wrap it. He didn't pack it. He didn't label it. He just chunked it out of the house of God. It keeps getting better and better. Or like they say in the South, gooder and gooder. Look at verse number 10. And I perceived that the portion of the Levites had not been given them for the Levites and the singers that did the work were fled everyone to his field. Then contended I with the rulers and said, why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their place. He came down to the house of God. He said, what is that apartment with that man doing there? Get it out of here. So he threw it out. Then he came back and said, where are your preachers? Where are your singers? They had so cut their pay that they had to go to the field to make ends meet. And Nehemiah said, that's not God's plan. Then people have been set aside for the work of God. You get them back here and you start paying them again and taking care of them. I'm going to stop right now and just say the Anchor Baptist Church, God bless you for taking care of this man and his wife and his family for all these years. Oh, how disappointing it is when the church feels like they have the right to starve the pastor out. I'm going to tell you right now, something needs to be happening in the churches of America. Amen. Nehemiah, boy, he's out of control, we think. He goes to the chambers to get that man's stuff out of here, that heathen. He said, then where are your spiritual leaders? Where are your preachers and your singers? Get them back here. Then look at verse 15. He, then he took on the people who were violating the Sabbath. Look at verse 15. In those days saw I in Judah some treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in sheaves and lading asses and also as also wine, grapes, and figs and all manners of burdens, which they brought into Jerusalem, look at this, on the Sabbath day. Now, stop right there. There was nothing wrong with the activity. There was something wrong with the activity on the Sabbath day. Look, look at, at which they had, which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I testified against them in the day wherein they sold the victuals. Look at it, verse 16. There dwelt men of Tyre also therein, which brought fish in all manner of ware and sold on the Sabbath unto the children of Judah in Jerusalem. Then I contended with the nobles of Judah and said unto them, what evil thing is this that ye do and profane the Sabbath day? He walked into that city and he saw them treading out. He saw the teenagers out there with their grape car wash on Saturday and they're just treading out the grapes. And he saw the little, the little kids grinding out the little tortillas for the little, little Spanish culture. And, and he saw everybody over there cooking ribs and, and over there for the Italians. And, and he stepped up on the Sabbath day. I love Italian food, by the way, and uh, Olive Garden. And uh, he stepped up. That's not really Italian food. And he stepped up there and he looked at that and he said, what are we doing? This is is the sabbath day you shouldn't be stomping grapes it's the sabbath day you shouldn't be laying those those donkeys down this is the sabbath day so he starts contending he first throws tobiah out and his stuff he then tells to get those preachers and singers back here then he takes on those who are set up shop and doing business on the sabbath look at nehemiah 13 19 it gets better never underestimate can i say this before i read this never underestimate how far a preacher will go to make sure the house of god is run right. Amen. Some church members underestimate how big the call of God is on the inside. Amen. I love Nehemiah. I don't think I, I love Nehemiah. Look at Nehemiah 13, 19. Look at him. He's sneaky. And it came to pass that when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath, 
I commanded that the gates should be shut and charged that they should not be open till after the Sabbath. And some of my servants set I at the gates that there should be no burden be brought in on the Sabbath day. You know what he did? He put the biggest women of the church with the meanest disposition. And he said, y'all woman, come here. You stand right there outside that gate, and we're going to lock this door, and you don't you let them people in here on the Sabbath day. So he said, all right, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. For the next five days, I'm going to get me a sermon. The sermon's going to be lock them gates. Don't give us Monday to Saturday to figure out what we're going to say on Sunday because that's too much time on our hands to find out exactly how to fix a problem. And Nehemiah, he fixed the problem, and guess what he did? He, my friend, locked the gates. When it came down to that Sabbath day, he locked them gates. He put his servants out there, and then no doubt he stood and said, you ain't getting in. Then I want you to look at what he did. Uh-oh, it's getting even better. Now look at verse number 20. So the merchants and the sellers of all kind were lodged without Jerusalem once or twice. That first Sabbath day, the things are locked. So they come up and they sit outside because they, they cannot believe, they cannot believe that somebody actually believes that the Sabbath day is to be holy. I cannot believe that you are keeping me from the house of God. We're not trying to keep you out of the house of God. We're trying to keep the world's activity out of the house of God. Well, I just can't believe that you're not going to let me serve down at the house of God. You can serve a spiritual song, but you can't serve that fish. And you can serve a praise, but you can't serve that wine press because this is the Sabbath and we're going to keep it holy. So they came that first week and they didn't believe that that preacher meant business. So they went home. They thought they'd come back that second week. And look at the sermon the second time they came. It's found in Nehemiah 13, 21. Then I testified against them and said unto them, why lodge ye about the wall? And the title of his sermon is the next phrase, if ye do so again. If ye do so again, I will lay hands on you. Hey, let me tell you something. Never take on a Baptist preacher. Because we may shake your hand and smile at you as you're going out the door. But you cross us. And there's a little bit of fight in us. We're not Presbyterians, and we're not Episcopalians, and we're not Catholic. We are Baptists. Our forefathers ate locusts and wild honey. Our forefathers did some amazing things. And Nehemiah, you know what he said? You show up here again, I'm putting my hands on you. You know, when that's pretty good stuff right there. When I was younger, in my younger days, been preaching for 27 years, in my younger days, Boy, I thought I could put my hands on anybody. During preaching, boy, I'd pick up teenagers. There was nothing for me. Walk down, pick up a teenager, and we'll shake them and put them back down and just, just pick them up, pick on people all the time. Well, I was preaching in Oregon. This cured me of ever laying my hands on anybody again. I was preaching in Oregon. My wife was with me, and I got to preaching, and I was preaching away at a teen meeting, and I walked down illustrating how the Word of God ought to shake you up. And so I reached down, picked this kid up, probably about 13 years of age, because you never pick somebody older. You always pick somebody younger, because it makes you look really scary when you can pick up a skinny kid and hold him by one hand. And so, so I shook him and threw him back down in the pew. He's grinning. He's, he's enjoying this. So the next day, I preached the morning service, and the youth pastor said, hey, Brother Ryan said, hey, we're we're going to take you and Miss Kelly out to eat on the seashore, on the seaside right there. I was preaching in Oregon. So we went out in this restaurant. We were overlooking the, the, the coastline, and it was gorgeous. Brother Ryan's cell phone rings, and he goes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. 15 minutes. Yes, sir. We'll, we'll, we'll be there. 15 minutes. And he looks at me and said, Brother Gray, we got to go back to the church because you're in trouble. And it was like, what do you mean I am in trouble? He said, you are in trouble. And I said, oh, no. I said, can you tell me what's going on? He said, nope, you're in trouble. Kelly looked at me and said, what did you do now? I said, I don't know. So we went back to the church, walked in, and there was a deputy sheriff standing there. And the pastor and I walked in, and, and uh, the, the, I almost called the pastor's name. The pastor said, said uh, Brother Gray, this is deputy so-and-so. And I said, man, good to see you. I stuck out my hand, shook his hand, and, uh, and I said, how's it going? He said, I got one question for you. Did you assault my son last night? Now, I'm from Texas. When you say assault, you picked up a Louisville slugger and you beat somebody half to death. You caught somebody robbing your house and you shot them twice. Propped them up and then shot them three more times. 
that's abuse. That's assault. And I said, no, sir, I don't even know your son. He said, my son came home last night and said that in the middle of the sermon, you reached down, picked him up and shook him and threw him back into the seat. I said, sir, I picked him up. I said, I shook him, but I did not throw him back into the seat. I put him back down. And he said, well, I'm going to arrest you. And I'm I, officially as a father pressing charges because that is assault. You did not have my permission to touch him. I looked at the pastor and said, is this a joke? And he goes, it's not a joke. I said, what do I need to do not to go to jail? And he said, three things. He gave me the three things I had to do. I did the three things, obviously, because I'm not in jail. Let me tell you something. I like Nehemiah, but he didn't live in 2014. <laughs> but here's Nehemiah. I'm not going to tell you what the three things are. You're just sitting there going, what are those three things? No. One of them was hug my mother-in-law, and I just was too far to go. And... So here's Nehemiah, and so he came and saw the abuse that was happening. He came to the, 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 the little apartment right there, threw out Tobiah's stuff. He said, get them preachers and them singers back here. He said that you shouldn't be doing this on the Sabbath day. He locked the gates to make sure they couldn't do it on the Sabbath day, and then he threatened them to make sure that if you do come back, I'm going to put my hands on you. This is a sad story of abuse at the house of God, but I'm going to tell you right now, this kind of abuse happens at every church across America at one point, and this abuse goes on more than what you realize it goes on. And then we wonder why a preacher gets tired of seeing the abuse of God's day, seeing the abuse of God's way being profane, and see the abuse of being, it being secular, secularized, set worldly. And, uh, and then we wonder why the preacher every once in a while has to stand up and scream, and has to stand up and contend, and has to stand up and testify, and even to the point of you think getting physical. Let me tell you something. If the preacher didn't do that, then guess what would happen? The the preachers would get run off the people of God will conduct business as usual on the Lord's day there would be nothing special about the Lord's day the church business would become secular business and I for one and one am a preacher that doesn't believe that God's house should be infiltrated and should be abused by what goes on in the world this of all places ought to be something that lifts up the name of Jesus Christ this ought to be a place that we can preach the Word of God let me tell you something you and I don't want to be a member of a church where abuse takes place. Amen. You say, well, what set this man of God off? What got him cranked up to where he were throwing people's stuff out? He was standing up preaching against everybody. How dare he lock the gates? How dare he tell people he's going to lay hands on them? It's what gets every preacher stirred up. See, you, uh, you sometimes think as laymen that, oh, you just have it personal against me. There's a personal vendetta. Let me tell you something. I want you to look at Nehemiah 13, verse 1, and this is what got him stirred up. On that day, this is what always does it, on that day, they read in the book. You say, what gets preachers stirred up all the time? I'm going to tell you what it is. He read in the book. Whenever a man of God starts reading the book, that's dangerous. Buy him a Reader's Digest, your church will go smooth. Buy him a dictionary, your church will go smooth. But don't ever put in his hands a King James Bible because once he starts to read it, he's going to start looking at the Word and looking at you. He's going to start taking the Word and going... Well, that's, that's not how someone ought to live. He's going to see you in Walmart. That's not how they're supposed to dress. He's going to see two teenagers alone in a car. He's going to be behind them coming home on Sunday night after church. And see them hugging all over each other. That's not how you're supposed to live. And then you better watch out because next Sunday morning it starts in his toes and he can't stand it that people would have the audacity, the audacity to bring that kind of liberal living inside the house of God. Don't blame your preacher for getting up and preaching it like it is. He's got the book. He done read in the book how people ought to live. So you got to give Nehemiah credit. 
and you can't be too hard on him, he held the truth of the word of God up and made the people understand this is God's house, this is God's day, and we do not do this on God's day. So fix it, he did, he threw out Tobiah. Fix it, he did, he brought back the preachers and the singers. Fix it, he did, he reinstituted the tithe of the corn and the new wine and oil. Fix it, he did, he sent men to distribute to the needs of the workers. Fix it, he did, he preached a whole sermon against those who were making a mockery of the Sabbath day. Fix it, he did, he locked the gates. Fix it, he did, he did, told the heathen, don't come back or I'm gonna lay my hands on you. All this started because of one thing, he found out what the word of God said about how the house of God ought to be done and how the day of God ought to be done. And then he pointed out, we need to make changes. I'll tell you right now, the people of Tyre that came to sell fish would have no business if the Jews would have stopped buying. Let's not blame the world too much for being worldly if the Christians would stop buying the worldliness and if the Christians would stop wearing... (coughs) <coughs> the worldliness and if the Christians would stop being entertained by the worldliness then we wouldn't have to worry as preachers the best policemen of society are the people of the society that simply say this is what God's word said it should have been the Jews kicking them out it should have been the Jews saying, whoa, whoa 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 this is a Sabbath day stop pressing out that wine stop stop selling those uh, fish stands on the side because when the people stop buying you say well what's the big deal about keeping the house of God special what's so big about keeping the place of God special and the ways of God special because if this institution does not hold the standard high then worldliness and profaning spills over into another institution and I want you to look at Nehemiah 13 verse 23 same chapter In those days also saw I Jews that had married wives of Ashdod, of Ammon, and of Moab, and then look at their children. And their children spake half in the speech of Ashdod and could not speak. Could not speak. Did you hear? Did you read that? Could not speak in the Jews' language. Do you know what that means? That the house of God and the day of God was so profaned and made normal that it didn't affect those who grew up with a good Sabbath day. It affected those babies that were born. Anchor Baptist Church will not survive another two and a half decades if Anchor Baptist Church doesn't let this man of God get up and let this man of God tell you Sunday's a special day. This house is a special place. This music better be sacred. This place better be run according to that book because you let that world out there make Sunday just another day. You dress just the same on Sundays you do on Monday and Tuesday. And when you listen to me and listen to me well. The house of God ought to be something special about it because if you don't hold it high, there will come a crop of children that will say Sunday school. Sunday school. I know there's Monday school. And I know there's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday school. There's no Saturday school unless you're bad. (laughs) Sunday school. What was that other word? Virginity. Virginity. Is that like another state in the union? You have Virginia, then virginity? Do you understand what he's saying? Because the people of God didn't keep the Sabbath day holy and didn't keep a distinction that those same people who did business inside the city brought along with them them good-looking women. And then them people that profaned on that Sabbath day, I only been preaching for about 30 minutes, so we're okay. That, that Tony Hudson usually takes 45, 50 minutes, so I still got time. They brought all these good looking, then these teenage boys that there was no difference about Sunday. They weren't on their bus route. They were treading out the wine press. They weren't teaching junior church and sitting with little bus kids. They they were treading out the wine press. And then they went, whoa. Whoa. Did you see her? And then they got married 
And then their children didn't even know the language. The reason the home, please listen to me, has marriage and children problem is because the church has lost and has an identity problem. We have to keep an identity. And there were so many abuses going on down at the house of God that when those abuses were allowed to go on, and this, all of a sudden, the Sabbath was being overrun by the work of the rest of the week. Then the Sabbath started taking on the characteristics. You know this world doesn't want preachers? They don't want people telling them what's right and what's wrong. Do you know that we have churches trying to become like the world to attract the world? We've changed everything about it. God bless this auditorium. This is a church auditorium. I mean, this is a church auditorium. This is a pulpit. I, I would be sh ashamed of your church if they brought you out a glass lectern and got you a stool for your 25th anniversary and instead of giving you a suit, gave you a Hawaiian shirt and, 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 and little jams to come out here and sit down. Come on now. Okay, good. And because uh, Miss Bell says you have the worst looking legs on this side of mankind. <laughs> Never mind, I better stop right there. <laughs> you know, I could understand, I could understand a home being worldly if they went to a worldly church. But I can't understand a home being worldly when you're the member of a church preaching the word of God. Amen. Can I ask you a question? What do you want from your pastor? Do you want him just to give in to whatever the world does? You wouldn't respect your pastor if he didn't get up every once in a while and say, let me tell you what the word of God says. Now, you can do whatever you want to do, but let me tell you what the word of God says. Let me give you several things how to stop the abuse at the house of God, and every member must remember this. Number one, you must keep the liberals out of leadership. Amen. Keep the liberals out of leadership. It is, you are, it, is, it is incumbent upon you if you're a leader, and you are liberal in your theology and in your behavior to resign this very moment. Don't you get in that classroom and be a leader that opens the word of God and start teaching something different than what your preacher says ought to be taught. If you're a deacon and you're a Calvinist and you're part of a soul winning church, a whosoever will church, then you need to resign from being a deacon. The leadership has to be in, co 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 in cooperation with God's word and how the pastor said, I want you to notice Nehemiah 13, 4. Look at it. And before, and, and before this, Elisha, the priest, having the oversight of the chamber of the house of God, was allied with Tobiah. Who was Tobiah? Look at verse number 18. Tobiah was an Ammonite. He had put in leadership an Ammonite. Boy, don't you get upset when the pastor says, hey, you're a King James only guy or you can't teach Sunday school. Here's how I expect you to live or you cannot be a spiritual leader. You, you probably could usher. You probably could. But let me tell you something. When you open this word of God and you're standing in front of the people or the young minds and the young people and you're trying to teach them the word of God, let me tell you something. You can't be liberal. There, there, there can't be any hint that you differ from the preacher down at the house of God. Because at that point, at that point, you have abuse at the house of God. Boy, we wonder why sometimes the church members sit. Now I'm done up. Now, now you done got me upset. So let's add another 10 minutes. Now you wonder why that the preacher gets up in the house of God and he can't get a holy grunt out of people in the pews and people sit there. And look like, and like he's weird. I promise you, you trace it back. There's a Sunday school teacher standing there going, well, you know, the preacher really, you know, that pastor. And, you know, last Sunday night sermon. Let me tell you something. Sunday school is not a dissecting time. Sunday school is a Bible teaching time. And if you're sitting here in leadership and you can't get behind the, the house of God and what it's supposed to be and what it's supposed to stand to, then go back to sitting in the pews and get a little bit more education. Brother and Miss Mann are here, and I can't tell a couple of stories I really want to tell right now because they are members of our church. But I had a guy walk up to me and said, what is this whosoever will stuff? And I said, what do you mean whosoever will? He said, what is that kind of stuff? And I said, it's just what God said, whosoever will. He said, oh, you know, there's some who are elected and some who are not. I thought he was kidding with me. That's <laughs> pretty good. No, no, pastor, listen to me. I'm being serious. 
I said, then I'll take your resignation right now. Right now. He said, you don't have the right to pull it. I said, oh, absolutely I do. Right now. You see, the abuse of the house of God starts at the top. No liberals in leadership. You, you shouldn't be giving credence to any other version. That's why they call it a version. Let me tell you something. Those other Bibles do not, do not clarify the King James. You understand that? Well, well, you know, it helps me better understand. If you get in tune with the Holy Ghost that lives on the inside, you would completely understand. And let me tell you this. Are you ready? If you don't understand it, doubt you, not the Word of God. Somebody asked me the other day about the end time, right? They, they showed me a verse out of Revelation. And I'm not going to tell you the verse. And the show. They said, what does that mean? You're our pastor. And I said, I don't know. They said, what? I said, I don't know. I have only been pastoring for five and a half years. <laughs> I'm like a five-year-old. I'm a kindergartner. I don't know. I'm just learning how to put up with deacons. I don't know about that end time stuff. I'm just now learning how to balance a budget. I don't know about that. I'm just learning now how not to offend the old codgers in the church. I don't know about that end time stuff. But I'll tell you this much. I'm not going to run to a liberal the theologian to figure out what it says. I told them this. I said, I promise you, I will read that verse every day for the next 30 days. And if God doesn't give me insight into what that verse means, I won't, I won't, I won't push it anymore. I, I can't even do the things I know. Liberals in leadership. Second, abuse at the house of God. Are you ready? How do you keep abuse out? Keep the liberals out of leadership. Number two, keep respect for the spiritual leaders. Keep respect for the spiritual leaders. Don't, don't you marginalize everything your preacher says on Sunday. Don't you go home and say, well, you know that, and I'm going to say this with all due respect, Brother Bell, and please don't throw me out of the pulpit. Really, you can't throw me out because I wasn't supposed to be here in the first place, so I really am not here. I am just a Fig Newton of your imagination, and uh, a figment, Fig Newton, get it? <laughs> I'll be sure and laugh at your jokes too one day. <laughs> don't, 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 don't let your preacher get up there and then on the way home, go, go, go. You're not the pastor. I'm going to use you. Okay. <laughs> come here. Come here. I'm going to use you. You ready? And don't, and don't go, don't go. Oh, oh, poor little Johnny. He, you know, pray for, he's underneath a lot of stress. That's why he acts that way in the pulpit. Come on. Come on. Come on. You better keep the utmost respect. Yeah. Thank you. There ought to be respect. There ought to be enough respect to say this, that's our pastor. You hear me, son? That's our pastor. You say, well, what if I think he's wrong? Then you get on your knees and go to his authority. If you think he's wrong, get on your knees and go to his boss. And tell his boss what's going on. And I think what you're going to find out is this. I think you're going to find out 99.99999% it's you and not him. Because truly, for that service, who prayed the most for that particular 30 minutes? Think with me. Truly, did you spend all week studying the Word of God for that 30 minutes? Did you spend your time on your knees putting time in prayer and walking the woods? Did you forsake your family to get on your knees? Did you really, truly get on your knees with an open book and say, Dear God, this is your food for your people on Sunday. God, take anything out of my heart that shouldn't be there. Put everything in that should be there. God, I've written notes, but if you don't want these notes, I don't want them. I want what you want. Have you truly spent that much time? Then don't make fun of him in private. Don't you get in the back room and call him by his first name. Don't you say, well, pray for him. He really doesn't know the needs of the people. He doesn't have to know the needs of the people. He has to know God's heart. God will make sure the needs of the people are met. I was preaching this particular sermon in our church, and I was getting cranked up. And I said, don't, don't say Bobby doesn't know. Poor Bobby, poor Bobby, poor Bobby. And I was getting cranked up because I've been there since I've been in eighth grade, and I had enough of people saying, well, you know, he's just a young kid. You know, I may not be older than you, but I preach a book that's a whole lot older than you. And so I just got wound up. Now, this name will mean a lot to some of you. 
We have a retired teacher from our school that is like, if God did have a sister, she would be it. So there's an appointment, and, 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 and I see the name on the card, and, and Miss Rainey comes in to see me, and she brings with me a, her, her a gift, and she gives me a gift, and it's a beautiful gold frame with a poem about the pastor. And she puts it down, and she just simply says, you know, pastor, would you please forgive us because in our class, it's our old people's class. We call them young at hearts. And old in body, young at hearts. <laughs> Said, we kind of referred to you as, as Bobby one time. and We didn't mean to offend. I was like, I wasn't even talking about you. <laughs> Your mother, Teresa, you can offend any time. Let me tell you something. You keep the liberals out of leadership, you'll keep the abuse out of the house of God. And you keep total respect for the spiritual leaders. God called them there. God put them in. Two things have to happen. Either you follow or you leave. Why would you stay at a church where you didn't want to follow the man of God? This sounds really terrible, but it'd be better for you to leave for the sake of your family than it would be for you to stay and tear the man of God down and ruin what's going on. Now, most pastors don't like it when I start preaching this way, but I'm going to tell you, I told our church the other day, listen to me, leave, but don't run me down. Get behind me, but don't run me down. I'm going to make a lot of mistakes because I'm only in the kindergarten of my pastorate. So please, if you're more mature than I, just grin and say he'll learn. But don't tear me down. They ran off the preachers and the singers. Keep the liberals out of leadership. Keep respect for spiritual leaders. Third thing is this. You ready? Don't profane God's commandments. Don't start in your personal life Start profaning. You know what profaning means? It says doing acts that violate the religious commandment. All of a sudden, you know what God says, but you start living the opposite way. Do you know long hair on, man, uh, on males is profaning the commandment of God? Do you know short hair on women is profaning the commandment of God? Do you know man's apparel on woman is profaning the commandments of God? Do you know woman's apparel on man is profaning the commandments of God? Do you know a man marrying a man is profaning the commandments of God? Do you know a woman marrying a woman is profaning the commandments of God? Do you know fornication is profaning the commandments of God? Do you know adultery is profaning the commandments of God? Gossiping is profaning. Not tithing is profaning and a crime and you should be horse whipped. And I didn't feel this way until I came until I became pastor. And uh, in modest dress is profaning. Being naked and showing skin that reveals private area, that's profaning. Sensual touching between members of the opposite gender, that's profaning. And oh, I love this excuse. Well, we're just friends. Then fine. Well, I, re I hold her hand, but I don't mean anything about it. We're just friends. Fine. Then run up to a total strange woman in the, in the supermarket and just hold her hand as she shops. Just say, ma'am, I don't mean anything by it. We're just friends. That's a lie. The reason you're holding her hand is because you're attracted to her. Man. Now, that's okay if you've been married for 41 years. That's not okay if you're not married. Man. Missing church is profaning. Man. Reading from so-called Bibles that deny the virgin birth is profaning. Man. Listening to music that appeals to the lust of the flesh is profaning. Man. Using God's name in vain is profaning. If you want to stop the abuse at the house of God, then you out there, guess what you do? You stop profaning the commandments of God. Now, all of us are sinners. All of us are going to get ourselves into a jam. And new believers, as they grow, they'll learn. And I, But I'm not talking about new believers right now. I'm talking about the old head Christians that you've been around this like I have all my life. And all of a sudden, we set aside some commandments because we want to do wrong in this area. But, boy, we'll say amen on the blood of Jesus and we'll say amen on the King James Bible. But, oh, you let us give our lustful movies and that's okay on our iPhone. Let me tell you something. Stop profaning the commandments of God. And then the last thing I'll tell you is this. Boy, this doesn't go over well. Raise your home to equal the standard of the church. I hear it all the time. Brother Jenkins, you probably have heard it through the years. I wish that church would stop reaching into my home. I wish they'd stop telling my home what to do. Oh, that's the wrong way to look at it. I wish your home would stop reaching into our church. I don't want to reach into your home. Are you serious? Every one of you have quirky things. Did you know that? That's why you're a family. If I came to your house and I saw the quirky things that you do, I'd be like, this family's weird. 
If everybody really thinks about it, you've got weird things going on at your house. When we first went to Texas, the very first meal we had, the Hallelujah Chorus came on, and the guy stood up. My mother is that way. She stood up during the Hallelujah Chorus. She looked at me and said, Glenn, get up. My father, Glenn, get up. My father, the food is getting cold. No, but we're standing for the Hallelujah Chorus. That's quirky. Queen Elizabeth, that's her song. That's not my song. I like eating. You know, let's make a deal. How about let's make a deal? Let's make a deal. I won't have rock music played before the church service if you won't play it in your car. How about let's make a deal? Monty Hall, let's make a deal. I won't show X-rated movies on the screen at the house of God if you won't watch them on the screen of the TV in your house. Let's make a deal. I won't let the lady serve or sing up here in a bikini. If you won't wear one during the summertime out there. I promise never to use any curse words in the pulpit. If you won't use the curse words in your private life. How about we take the home and raise it all the way up to the standard of the church? Do you know why we laugh and we have a good time here in the house of God? Because God gave us a standard. You can have that same peace inside your home. You don't have to be blind while this blind fellowship. Let me tell you something. You attend a fundamental independent Baptist church, it's not blind fellowship. We start out every preaching service with this phrase somewhere or the other. Take your Bibles and turn to because we want you to see it. It's not a Catholic church. We don't want you to trust me. We want you to see it. And then guess what you're supposed to do? You're supposed to study it. You're supposed to double check what the preacher says through the word of God. And I think what you're going to find out, you'll come to the same conclusion he comes to. Now, everybody's growing, okay? I had a guy last night, after, after I'm done with this, I had a guy last night, he came in and said, Pastor, Pastor, I, every time I get nervous, I got to smoke. Every time I get nervous, I got to smoke. Every time I get nervous, I got to smoke. I said, well, then let's not address the smoking. Let's address the nerves. I never thought about that. I said, let's calm you down so that you don't have to have a cigarette. I never thought about that. So I don't have to chew gum. I said, no, 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 no. Let's calm you down. He, Jesus said, my peace I leave with you. So let's get you peaceful on the inside so you don't get nervous so that you don't have to have a smoke. He said, Think it'll work. And I said, look at me. I haven't smoked in years. <laughs> he just started laughing. He said, I don't think you've ever smoked, have you? I said, see, it works. <laughs> so I gave him some verses. And I said, I want you to read them. When are your smoke breaks? And he said, well, my smoke breaks are these. And I said, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Take your Bible. And here's some verses I want you to read. Before I left the hotel tonight, he called and said, guess what? I haven't been nervous all day. And I said, guess what? You probably hadn't smoked either. He said, no. Not at all. He said, I'm getting nervous talking to you. I think I need to go get a cigarette. <laughs> and I, I said, calm down, my brother. Calm down. Calm down. You know, perfection is never required in this business. You just open up your home and you open up your life and you just simply say this, dear God, you, I want my life to equal the word. And there's only one place that we go to every single week that gives us the word. And I love the spirit. I love the joy. I love the laughter. I love the peace. I love the good time. I love the fellowship. You know why we have that? Because we have the word. How about all of us get involved at stopping abuse at the house of God? Amen. This should be a very special place. Amen. Sunday should be a very Amen. special day. Amen. And don't require your church to be worldly. You require your church to be scriptural. Amen. And when you, you and I get behind it, guess what we're going to find? Our children will understand our lingo. Our children will get it. They'll grow up and they'll love the Lord. They'll be normal. A little bit normal. 
okay, weird in a normal society, but we're just passing through, okay? You know, let's just get behind the house of God. God bless you. Abuse at the house of God. Let's not let it happen in our house. Amen. God bless you.